Welcome to the podcast of the FIB, the International Federation for Structural Concrete. I'm Patrick, your host of the Conceptual Design podcast series. My guest of today's episode number one is Jeanette Kuo. Jeanette Kuo is a founding partner of the architectural practice Karamuk Kuo, based in Zurich. Established in 2010 with Unal Karamuk, the work of the office focuses on the intersection of spatial concepts and constructive technologies, recognizing architecture as a social and material discipline. The office works on projects of a range of scales, from schools and housing to complex cultural projects, and has been published in numerous international journals, including Architees, Werk, Bau und Wohnen, Metropolis and Casabella. Recent projects include the International Sports Science Institute in Lausanne, the Augusta Raurica Archaeological Center, Weiden Secondary School and Cham Apartments. This year they were recognized by Domus as one of the 50 best architectural firms of 2020. Beyond her practice, Kuo regularly contributes to the architectural discourse through her academic commitments and writings as well as participation in conferences and symposia. Her publication, A Typical Plan, Projects and Essays on Identity, Flexibility and Atmosphere in the Office Building, received the 2013 Most Beautiful Swiss Book Award. She regularly serves on international competition juries and most recently was European jury president for the Lafarge Holzim Awards for Sustainable Construction. In 2016, Kuo was the recipient of the competitive Maybach Teaching Fellowship at UC Berkeley, as well as an award for her research project, Infrastructural Opportunism. Since then, she has also taught at MIT and from 2011 to 2014 held a visiting professorship at the Ecole Polytechnique Fédérale de Lausanne. In addition, she has lectured and had been a guest critic at numerous institutions such as ETH Zurich, Columbia University, the Cooper Union, Rhode Island School of Design, Academia di Architettura Mendrisio, Pratt Institute, Hong Kong University, and the University of Toronto. Kuo received her Bachelor of Arts in Architecture from UC Berkeley, a Master of Architecture with Distinction from Harvard, and a Master of Advanced Studies from ETH Zurich. Welcome, Jeanette. And... Um, would you like to present yourself? Um, great. Well, first off, thank you so much for the invitation. Um, and um, uh, maybe I can start off just uh, saying a little bit what I do right now. Um, so currently I am, um, you know, I've been since 2010 having my own office uh, together with my partner, you know, Karamuk. Um, our office is called Karamuk Quo um, and based in Zurich. So. Um, we're essentially an architecture office, but of course we do design across all scales, you know, everything from, um, you know, urban design down to furniture elements and things like that and exhibitions. Um, but of course, um, our main focus is um, the, the design of buildings um, and a lot of, uh, let's say, public and cultural buildings, but also now more recently, um, quite a few housing projects as well. Okay, that's cool. I've been to a conference of Mario Botta a few years ago, and he said that his dream was always to design a chair. <laughs> <laughs> he never had the chance to do it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Would you like to tell us why you became an architect? Uh, was it by chance? Uh, how did it happen? Or did you have a feeling that you were becoming an architect since you were a small child? Um, well, you know, it's one of those things where I think um, it, it sort of developed over time. Um, it wasn't something that was super clear to me, although I had people, uh, cousins and uh, people in my family that were kind of going in that direction. I had also some other, my brother was uh, an en or is an engineer. Um, so there were people within the family that were already having sort of similar, let's say, interest in the built environment um, that got me interested in that. But in fact, I think I, I really decided on it when I started in university and realized that it actually was one of the few disciplines that um, brought together uh, a kind of social, political, 
side of things, of understanding you know, how we as, as people interact with each other, um, but within a very sort of design-oriented spatial environment. Um, and I think that was the, the thing that for me was, was interesting, um, that there was, there was one side that was very sort of um, humanistic, but on the other hand, also very technical and very, um, very let's say, uh, cultural and design-oriented. Okay, so I really have a follow-up question on that one, because I think during your career you have traveled a lot, you have studied in the US, you have lived in, in Europe, is there a difference uh, of how people interact with each other that also translates in a difference in architecture and urban planning? And could you explain us these differences in the place you have lived? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, I think all you have to do even is look at public spaces in different countries. You know, I grew up in Indonesia and in fact, um, there was a kind of a fear, let's say, of public spaces. We didn't spend very much time. There wasn't really urban parks, let's say, because everything was about the kind of private sphere. And um, and so you spend a lot of time indoors and, and places that were considered almost like public collective spaces are more, more like shopping malls and, you know, places that are already quite curated um, versus, for example, in, um, in Europe, which is the complete opposite, um, or also in, in the US, which maybe is a little bit in between. But, uh, but if you think about how we invest or what we think about uh, public space and how we use public spaces um, already, I think it shows some of the cultural differences. Okay, so, so back to this idea of public spaces and maybe the connection between also architecture and politics. Is there uh, this intertwining between how much is politics uh, intervening on public spaces and how much should be more private property or more public property? I guess there are different world rules also connected to politics in those different places. I think in Europe we are pro-government and we really like that government takes this action to build public spaces for us. I guess it's not always the case. No, and I, I think you know what, what I realized as well now having lived in Switzerland for the last 12 years is it feels to me that Switzerland is really the kind of in-between um, model, let's say, of how much a government is involved or not involved. Um, because if you think about where we really want them to be invested, a lot of times also it's about the things that we cannot achieve alone, right? Meaning um, with just a kind of pro public money, you cannot do something which essentially is um, negotiating different parties. You have to have somebody that sort of has that backing that helps and also has the, the funding source, let's say, that helps to kind of build up a collective. And so I think in, in Switzerland, um, there is a lot of investment into the public realm, um, into public infrastructures and collective spaces that makes urban living of a certain quality. Um, and at the same time, you know, they there's a very strong, I mean, we see that now with the whole pandemic situation and how they're handling it, is that there's a very strong, um, let's say, identity of Switzerland of remaining pretty independent from the government on, on other levels, um, both on the kind of economic level, you know, in terms of how companies are, are regulated, or also in terms of the, the, the way in which um, uh, government sort of steps in to, to handle certain, let's say, freedoms <laughs> in this case. And, um, and whether or not, you know, we, we, we agree with what's going on, I think it's a little bit of the mix. Whereas, you know, for example, in, in other places in Europe, Germany or, or France, there probably is a much stronger government presence. And then in the US, it's the other opposite end where there's very little money being spent and very little attention being spent on public space um, or let's say public infrastructures. Yeah, yeah, I, I totally agree with you. I think they, they really have a good mix. And it's probably also because they have a lot of different cultures and different languages that need to live together. So they need somehow to get along mm -hmm. and somehow they need to express, everyone needs to express their own culture, but still 
they need to collaborate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And this reminds me of uh, the first day when I came uh, to Switzerland for my PhD. I landed in Geneva. I think it was something 11 o'clock in the night and I took this train to Lausanne and there was a strange person on the train. And he told me, yeah, look, Switzerland is absolutely the place to be here. Everyone speaks at least two or three languages. So you really made a good choice. And uh, in, this, in this time, Switzerland is one of the most um, prosperous countries, he would, he would say. And I think that was also one of the moments I decided that uh, Switzerland was really a good place to be. Uh, listening to someone so excited about it. Did you also have some one of these moments? Yeah, you know, I think that it's, it's, um, it's interesting because Switzerland is one of those countries that from the outside can seem very different, very intimidating because it's so organized, it's so clean, it's so structured. I mean, I remember when I first arrived, I came from New York after having lived in New York for five years. And, um, and I just was like, uh, I felt it was t very constraining, almost too conservative, because, you know, I was used to the chaos and the mess. But then once you actually realize the benefits also of, of what this means, you know, that there is a, a way in which things work and the way in which people really do sort of, as you say, respect each other and everybody's sort of uh, different takes and diversity, um, that idea of creating common ground, um, of course, necessitates a bit of um, concession from everyone, a, you know, a, a way of um, compromising to a certain degree. So maybe you don't get the same extremes that you do um, in countries where you are free to do whatever you want, you know. And, and it's not that you're not free here, but I think it's more the, let's say, there, there is a kind of a social contract, I feel, here, that everybody that is part of it feels responsible, right? Like when I, there's no rules, there's no law that says we have to do things a certain way. But somehow it's very easy here in Switzerland that when you see, okay, everybody's clean, everybody picks up after themselves. Um, there's there's very low crime rates. You know, you you leave your wallet somewhere and you can find it again, you know, a day later. And that, you know, that this is the only place in the world where that has happened to me uh, multiple times even. And, and, and that basically gears you up also to acting a certain way towards your peers, you know, to, to basically saying, well, I am part of this and I want to make sure that this stays, you know, as a safe and, and collective environment. And I guess you, you can really integrate, integrate your architecture well inside this, let's say, mental space and this mentality. Yeah, well, so to a certain degree, you know, of course, um, because of this kind of, um, let's say, collectivity, there is a certain, let's say, culture and tradition that is already there that makes it very difficult sometimes to break the mold and to do something quite radically different. Um, that's maybe some of the things that, that I miss about some, you know, some other environments that I've been in. But at the same time, I think that what's great about it is that there is a very strong uh, basis, let's say, already of a very high quality and a very high standard, and that there is a very strong mindset amongst the different people that we collaborate with that is about a certain openness and, and uh, openness to engaging, you know. Um, so I feel like uh, in the kind of consultants that we've had on together on projects or even people that are, you know, the, the, the contractors and suppliers, um, there is a kind of conversation which at the base level um, is more difficult uh, in, other, in other cultures that I've been encountered. Okay, great. And do you miss uh, all these cultural differences or the, all this traveling that, that you had until now? Or maybe to, to say it in a different way, um, Maybe tell us about your personal development that came alongside with the educational development and how that 
links to the different places you've been. Mm -hmm. So, um, you know, as I was saying before, is that um, I actually, of course, lived in, in quite a number of different places and countries. I grew up in Indonesia, um, you know, went to study in the U.S. and then also worked a couple of years in, in Germany um, and, you know, that back to the U.S. again before starting uh, our practice here in, in Zurich. Um, and, you know, throughout that whole sort of uh, stretch, I think that there was always a kind of a consciousness of um, engaging with architecture as really part of the built environment. Um, and also, you know, an interest in, in looking at it in terms of the, the two different sides, let's say, meaning the, the academic, the kind of more theoretical um, investigations, and then also the practical uh, side in terms of really applying, you know, the research and the thinking into reality. Um, and that's actually, I would say, the, the main reason, in fact, why we decided to come and start our practice in, in Switzerland, because it, for us was the, the environment that allowed us to do both at the same time. Um, you know, I had been teaching in the U.S. for, for a couple of years before we moved um, and started our practice here. Um, and for me, it was always a little bit difficult, let's say, at that time to think of myself standing in front of the students and being and having the authority, let's say, to kind of or, or the experience to teach them when I hadn't actually established my own practice. Um, and so for me, it was re really important that I was able to kind of bridge those two cultures, especially within the context of, of American academia, where, where that is very much split. You know, the, the, the idea of um, a, a kind of academic track versus a professional track is in the, in the American, let's say, construction industry very much, uh, very much split. Yeah, this is really a problem we, we are facing today. Maybe uh, we can jump into the sustainability from mm -hmm. here because there are a lot of re researchers going on on more sustainable uh, ways to build, on more sustainable materials, on circular economy, but it's really difficult to put them in practice. And from my perspective, even something as simple as solar panels, I don't know what is your thinking about it, but every time I see solar panels, I have the impression they're ugly. <laughs> <laughs> so I have the feeling also there is no integration in architecture of sustainability yet. And I would like to hear your opinion where we could start to work on it. So my, you know, um, it, it's... Um it's great that you're you're asking this question because it's a preoccupation of mine now since several years. Um, I don't know if you're aware of it, but I've been involved also in the um, uh, Holtzim Foundation that does the awards, you know, the, the Holtzim Awards for Sustainable Construction, which is a kind of biannual um, award cycle that's global, that actually recognizes essentially projects that kind of push that boundary. Um, and when I got started being involved in it as a jury president for the European um, region, one of my biggest like, questions in a way was why aren't more architects dealing with this topic? And why are we looking at it in a way which seems very antiquated, you know, very much sort of 20 years ago? And that, that to me is the, the fact that we, are, we have been always looking at it as a technological question. Um, we had been looking at sustainability as, you know, PV cells that we apply to a building rather than to fundamentally rethink how we, exactly we are designing buildings. And I think that has been changing. Actually, I've noticed that in the last few years, it's become more and more um, a topic. Um, you know, I was looking at it from my own research about um, Actually, when I was teaching as a, as a visiting professor in Lausanne, I was already starting to look at that. Um, uh, I was work, working at that time also on two books that, that have now come out uh, about really the, the idea of um, relationship between uh, structure and space and then uh, looking at those through certain sort of architectural typologies like the office building or the industrial building. And, and part of that was to say, you know, why have we been looking at aesthetics and technical and sustainability as, as separate categories? 
you know, because technically what we should be doing should embody sustainability. But what does sustainability mean when we think about it in more integrative terms? And I think that has to do, on the one hand, with um, an understanding that what we build lasts for a long time, <laughs> that that we have to understand that what we build is not just for the immediate user, but really about the fact that we are guardians of a certain built environment and that these buildings contribute to that built environment, but also that they contribute to an idea of a culture that will be in that building you know, for the years to come. And how can we best use that building as almost an infrastructure um, that can allow for you know, adaptation or flexibility or, or rethinking and reuse um, over the years. Um, and, so, and so that then starts to tap into a more conceptual thinking. You know, how do we relate architecture back to things that are not just about applying to a surface, but a, a deep reorganization of that, of that basis? Yeah, I see. So I think if my understanding is correct, you really want to integrate the concept of sustainability in the program, in the architectural program, and not only have it in the materials, in the technical aspects like uh, renewable energies and insulation and so on. Of course, these are important topics, but let's put the program again, the architectural program at the core of our sustainable project? I, I would maybe slightly sort of um, uh, replace it with a different word. I would actually say architectural concept because program is also one of those things that we've relied on a lot, right? Program, when we say architectural program, we think about the use of that space, like meaning, is this an office building? Is this a, um, a housing building? But one of the things that maybe is interesting is also to say, well, sometimes in fact, those programs change you know, a space that is being used as an office might become uh, something else in 10 years. Um, and, and the, but, the, but the idea uh, behind this kind of thinking was to say, can we start at the, can we start a little bit earlier? Not to think of sustainability that comes at the end as something that's applied after design is complete, but really something that reorganizes the way that we approach design. And so if we start thinking about, like, you know, usually we, when we get a um, project brief, right? A lot of architects, they start and they design and they think about, well, the design is what we hand over to the client and the building is built, our responsibility is done. But that's not the case, right? We know now, and this is now also in the last five years becoming more like, you know, whatever, last, uh, five to six years, becoming more and more to the forefront is that the, our responsibility doesn't actually stop there. You know, our responsibility is the lifespan of that building. So how do we make sure that that building actually can still survive or is worth keeping or is, you know, is, is, uh, is possible to sort of um, be, be around for the next, you know, I don't know how many years, right? 80 to 100, let's say. Um, and, and what that means is that the concepts that we come up with have to d deal with um, the temporality of that building, either it's short term or it's long term. But if it's long term, we have to think about what that durability means because different materials have different lifespans, um, different systems in a building have different lifespans. So we start talking about, you know, uh, material systems and organizing through material systems, right? And, and how do we kind of recycle and demount and, and replace certain things? So it does relate back to what you were saying before about materials and and technical you know solutions but those are not the things that generate a concept right those are things that actually come as as part of the the let's say base thinking that goes into um, the architectural project so I think what I'm, I was interested in is to get architects interested in the in the earlier let's say application of sustainability to start thinking already, from the very get-go, how do we approach this on a conceptual level that links it back to all of these other aspects? Yeah, cool. Th thank you for going so much uh, into detail in that. I really appreciate it. And following on it, I sometimes have the impression that buildings are torn down just too easily. There are different examples of, at, where at least the structural 
part of the building is really well intact and it could survive still many years. But due to costs and probably bad insulation of the building, uh, bad sound throughout the different levels, the floors and so on, investors just prefer to tore a building down and rebuild a new one. Do you have the same feeling as me or? Yes, well, I mean, I do think that, um, you know, any of the, um, I think, well, first of all, maybe just to say that I think with sustainability, we have to really look at it on all levels these days in order to kind of, you know, get to where we need to get to in the next, you know, five, 10 years. Um, and, and one of them is really to kind of look again at our current built environment to see where we've been missing, you know, where, where, where we could have actually, um, uh, let's say, made more use of what we already have. So what we have as part of our built environment right now is also, you know, resource, material resource. And if we can re reduce having to kind of build new, we reduce the use of new resources, but we also make use of what's already there. Uh, and so that's, of course, something that's, that's very, very important um, that we start doing that more. Um, I think that one of the things that, of course, is, is difficult is trying to sort of balance out um, what that exactly means with the needs of, you know, of, of the uh, projects and the, the, the um, uh, people that are coming up with that. So I think it has to happen also on, on multiple levels of the kind of political, um, let's say, machinery that sort of is pushing for different new projects to be ha you know, happening within the kind of urban space, but also at the same time with us as designers trying to look for those opportunities where we can reuse um, as much as possible. Do you have a special trick to convince your clients to be invest more in sustainable projects? I think that um, there, well, I, I'm not sure that if there's a trick, but I think that um, if we embed it within the architectural concept, then there's no way to remove it from that, right? So this is why I think it was also important that somehow it's not about something that they that's just applied, that they can say, well, now we have no more budget, so we can very easily take away those uh, photovoltaics that's on the roof because it's removable, right? This is also what very often happens is that you go into these project phases and and when the budget goes over, you start looking at things that can be removed quite easily. Um, and But if we start to integrate the thinking of it, so a lot of the technologies, in fact, that we've been looking at more and more are low tech. You know, we've been looking at how, how can we make use of uh, natural processes, natural ventilation, um, uh, also more sort of thermally activated systems and things like that, rather than, um, you know, relying on heavy machinery or on things that essentially will not just cost more, but essentially use up more resources. Yeah, that, that's really cool. So when I was in Brazil, okay, so small parenthesis, yeah. obviously in Brazil they have uh, a very different climate, but I was in the University of uh, Salvador de Bahia, the architectural university, which was built by Lele. He was the right hand side of Oscar Niemeyer. And there are uh, some windows where there is just no glass, it's open. So there is this natural ventilation through the building and there is an amazing climate inside of it. But then of course, uh, in Switzerland we have a different climate and it's a bit harder to achieve. Yeah, well, I mean, I think that, you know, we just have to look basically at the specifics of every situation, right? And I think that that is our responsibility as well as architects and and um, and, and convince clients. Actually, that's one of the places where we have to convince clients more is, you know, how do we rethink this question of comfort? Um, because in, you know, from the 50s, let's say to the 80s, 90s, it's been a very uniform approach, which is to say, Comfort is something which is established and controlled from a central 
um, you know, uh, a centralized kind of point um, that that everybody somehow should be fitting within, uh, let's say, the 21 to 23 degree Celsius range of, of comfort. Um, and that's what it is. Um, and we will pump the building full of uh, air conditioning in order to reach that, regardless of where in the world you are, right? This is this has been the case. And whereas we know that, in fact, culturally speaking, that has been very, very different. I mean, you know, the, the age of air conditioning, when we look at it relative to the span of history that we've had, is very minuscule. We have maybe, you know, half a century of air conditioning, let's say, um, but we've had centuries of building with environments that are in fact quite different and people have known and lived in very different conditions and, and been able to adapt to that. Um, so it is, it is also about you know, human habit and, and kind of cultural conditioning in that sense of what do we accept and what don't we accept. And I think that the problem is that um, in the last you know, 20, 30 years, we've gotten so used to certain things that um, we in fact are, are, are becoming kind of unreasonable about thinking what, that, what comfort could mean to us. You know? So I think this, this idea of maybe broadening that discussion of um, broadening also our definition of what comfort could be, um, which anyways we know is, is very much not only based on the individual, but based on a kind of cultural, um, a cultural understanding. And you can make a, a really nice rediscovery. Yes, so absolutely. I, I was in Ticino last weekend and a friend of mine rented out the house. And in this house, you had a big stove uh, in the basement that was used for heating food and heating the room. And it was powered by timber, by wood. And then in the upper floors, there was no heating. And actually, it was one of my best nights that I slept there because the temperature was not so warm. And probably in most of our apartments, it's actually sometimes even too warm yes. and we don't even realize it. Yes, absolutely. and. You know, I mean, I think we just have to look also at different um, different places in the world and, and realize that people have learned to live in different ways. Like in in um, Chile, for example, I was spending a winter there. I worked there for about four months um, and there is no central heating in most buildings. Um, and in fact, um, you know, we learned to make do, but that was it was also fine. It was uh, one, you know, after you got used to it, then it's OK. And you 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 kind of um, learn to adapt, you, you sort of put on more clothes and you kind of leave off more clothes. It's the same thing, you know, in Japan as well, right? Um, um, before they, you know, of course did the whole sort of modernization is that the buildings were meant as a shelter, but they were not to kind of completely seal you off from the exterior. Um, you as a person are responsible for your own personal comfort, right? In terms of putting on more clothes or less clothes and you adapt to that. And I think that, um, this is the thing that we've maybe sort of divorced ourselves from by trying to create an even temperature regardless of where in the world we are. Yeah, yeah, I totally agree with you. Really interesting. Um, but back to Chile. Uh, I was in Chile for a summer workshop with at the um, Ciudad Abierta. Was that the place you were working as well? No, actually, I was at the Pontifica um, Católica in in in, uh, in Santiago. Um, uh, I was at at the time actually working on the project, one of the projects for Elemental uh, when they first started, and they had this kind of competition with you know students and and architects, and then they were building seven different uh, housing sites. Um, so I was at the Ciudad Abierta because um, the project that I was working on was in fact in uh, Valparaiso. Yeah. Um, so of course I, I was visiting and, and very curious about that as well. Yeah. It's an amazing place of yeah. architectural experimentation yeah. and space where yeah. I think where space is unique and there are some of the most bizarre tectonics yes. I've ever seen. <laughs> Definitely. Yes, yes, absolutely. But also actually quite quite exciting just in the sense that students could be very hands-on in terms of that experimentation. Yeah, I think we really missed that in our education. So I, did, I had my degree in uh, civil engineering. Mm -hmm. 
and I never touched anything real during all my studies. It was all theoretical. Then I moved on and I worked in a, in the practice in a design office and everything was on paper and on the computer. So there was no really, no contact with the material. And that's why I sort of decided to do my PhD at EPFL, or it was one of the decisive points that I wanted again to be in touch with the material and the experimental part of the research was definitely something where you were hands-on and in contact with the material. I really appreciate that. And I think today I have a different relationship with materials than I had before. Do you have the same experience? Yeah, I mean, I, I have to say, in fact, my experience might even have been more extreme than yours. You know, I mean, it's, I think in the US, it's um, notorious that the um, let's say that the education is very much more conceptual and theoretical. Um, so, you know, for me, all of that came with my uh, engagement more in the kind of professional fields. And I think I was very lucky that I was able to work in uh, Berlin for a couple of years before going back to do my master's. So it was between my bachelor and my master's that I um, that I took this kind of longer break. And, and of course, that was very eye opening because going back to my master's, uh, I think I had a kind of a stronger understanding or also a greater hunger for, un for, for approaching architecture from a constructive side. Um, you know, that it wasn't just about the, the kind of conceptual and theoretical driving force behind it, which was also important, but that it was really about this negotiation of those two sides. And I think once you get in touch also with this constructive side, you're forced to engage with engineers yes and that's also something i've totally missed during my basic education was that engineers and architects were regarded as two separate authors whereas there really is an intense collaboration when you look at uh, one or what we think are our most prominent projects there is really an intense collaboration between the engineers and the architects mm -hmm. i think the best way for us to communicate is either through drawings, uh, which is the most common one, or through references, which is also really important. And we as engineers have actually no idea about reference whatsoever. So it's something that we need to accumulate during our career. Uh, do you, would you agree on that or would you see other ways of communication? Yeah, so um, I'm glad that you brought this topic up because that's also something that's very close to me. Um, in fact, um, you know, my whole thesis was about rethinking uh, the role of structures in, um, in kind of building design um, and actually even in urban design because the, the, the project was in fact relating to uh, a series of infrastructures um, within urban space. Um, but, you know, in any ways, to, to kind of answer your question more directly is that um, I actually think that for us, at least, the most important tool for that communication has been the uh, model, the physical model. Um, we very often sit with our engineers very early in the process and we look at models together um, because it's very three dimensional. Um, it's something where within one artifact, you could say, you could express so many different things, you know, from the kind of conceptual organization to something which is very experiential. And then you can understand why um, certain things or certain decisions might be made because, um, you know, you, you, in the drawing, it's always very abstracted um, somehow. It's, it's always looking at it from just one point of view. Um, it depends on the section you show or the plan that you show, but in a model, you know, it's dynamic, it's three-dimensional. We can each approach it from our sides, but we can then find that middle ground in terms of negotiating, let's say, what really needs to happen. So, you know, with, with the model, it's very dynamic also in terms of the process of it, because on the table, when we're together, we start working on it. We take pieces off, we put new pieces in. You know, it's, it's something that we actually do very often. Okay, do you have a special way of building these models that are so dynamic where you can interchange these pieces? It's, it's not a special way. It's more the fact that it's, um, it's our own process in the office. So I think that maybe one thing to note is that um, that has been a, a particular interest of ours, um, uh, that, that we the work that we do is very much engaging with um, structures and space 
as being fundamental sort of, let's say, uh, conceptual basis of architectural projects. Um, not that structures comes at the end as a problem to be solved, like to, to, to hold the building up, but really that it comes at the beginning in terms of how we think about space and relationships of spaces. Um, so I think, you know, we have to say that, that that is maybe a very particular way that we work in our office and it's maybe not how everybody, you know, not how all architects uh, work, but, um, but it is also something that, you know, hits on what you were talking about before, which is the split of the two disciplines. Um, you might remember, you know, when we first met, uh, we met at the, the FIB um, conference, where, you know, for me, it was uh, the opportunity to, to really look at uh, this divergence, right, of the two professions, let's say, uh, which technically a few hundred years ago was one discipline. You know, we never had that, you know, the architect, the builder, the, the, the engineer was, was one person or at least one discipline um, that was about uh, really creating spaces for our built environment. And it was only in the kind of times of modernization when things started to get more complex that we you know, kind of split off into different directions. Um, and, and I think for us, what's still very, very exciting um, are people, you know, when you're talking about references and who we look to as references, um, we very often look at, you know, um, people that can't be strictly categorized into either an engineer or an architect. Um, you know, personally, I, I, a, lo a lot of my own research with my students, but also when I was doing my thesis and things like that, was uh, on, on people like um, Pierluigi Nerfi, you know, on, on uh, Maillard, um, Auguste Perret, you know, all of, the, all of these um, characters, let's say, that, that were, def you know, redefining, let's say, the, the boundaries of those professions. They were also contractors. They were also contractors, which is, you know, the builders, and they, which is also very important because they were able to take the risk, let's say, themselves of experimenting on something. Because sometimes, you know, as an engineer and an architect, we can be trying to push a conceptual end, but nobody would want to build it <laughs> because they don't want to take that risk. So I think where, where it was interesting was that with some of these people, when they build their own ideas, um, they don't have to negotiate to convince the builders, you know, that this would actually work. Even though I, I think that if today we would propose such a team of a master builder, let's say, who is doing everything from the architecture to engineering and construction, we would look at it as a, too much a central power and too much of a monopoly. Could be. I mean, in fact, I don't think I'm advocating for us to go back to that model. I'm not even sure it's possible because there is, you know, of course, a much greater complexity these days. There's a much greater complexity just in the scale of buildings, the scales of the technologies that we are integrating, and not any one person can actually tackle all of that. And if they did, probably the work, you know, you could, you wonder whether it really comes to uh, fruition. I think that what is interesting, though, in, in looking at these characters in history that have defined those or redefined those boundaries is more to say, where can we be more effective in the conversations? You know, where can we actually think about connections between these professions and ways of engaging with and conversing with these other professions in a more integrative way? Um, not thinking about them as the other, right? Because uh, again, if I go back to my own experience within the US and how, you know, uh, we had in school or in, in, in uh, even afterwards in, in offices been working with engineers, it was very often coming in after the design concept has been established, um, which basically means, you know, they're there to solve a problem but they're not there to brainstorm with us about how to reframe that problem. Um, and I think what we were interested in when we started our practice was to say, well, what is a better model that allows us to tackle you know, the complexities of, of, um, of, of the issues that we're facing today, which you know, of course has to do with sustainability, it has to do with um, uh, also you know, other types of demands that we didn't have before, 
um, that come from the clients, that come from you know the the environment that we're that we're in. But that at the same time allows us to do it in the most effective way because we integrate from the very beginning. Yeah. What do you think about uh, Miss Van der Rohe and some of the solutions he proposed where the structure seems to be uh, are it, or where you cannot really tell if the structure is structure or if it's design and architecture and ornament. Mm -hmm. And which maybe from a structural point of view, if a structural engineers would look at um, the buildings of Miss van der Rohe, they would make no sense at all in terms of optimization of the structure itself. Yeah. So um, I think that this is this is something that also, you know, for, for me has been a, a very interesting, let's say, topic uh, to delve into. Um, uh, I was presenting, you know, this kind of pairing of Mies van der Rohe with, um, with Antoni Gaudí um, during the, the FIB conference um, this past fall. Um, and, and part of that was to kind of provoke let's say, the, the kind of common misunderstanding that people have of these two characters, right? Because when you look at Nice, you think, well, he's very rational. But in fact, it's, it's, it's quite irrational if you look at it from a, from a technical point of view, from the, the structural point of view. And then uh, somebody like a Gaudi, like Gaudi, where people misunderstand, let's say, from the public, uh, non-professionals, misunderstand him as being somebody who is very frivolous with kind of ornamentation, but in fact is very, very rational with his structural thinking and even the kind of models that he uses to test, to optimize, let's say, the structures in his projects. Um, so for me, it was kind of interesting because these two represent to a certain degree the, the spectrum of what we have to deal with in architectural design, but also in the relationship between architecture and structures. Um, I think that um, at the end of the day, both from a structural point of view and an architectural point of view, design is always about making choices. Um, and it's always also about making choices which has, uh, let's say, a certain sort of spatial experiential effect. Um, it's about creating an environment, right, that we, we can perceive in different ways um, that, is, that is very physical. But that also evokes, let's say, our, our collective memory of certain things, certain things that we associate with it. And, and so I think that for me, it's not a kind of moralistic question of this is good and this is bad, um, but more, you know, what does a project need? And some, you know, in, in the case of Mies, of course, his, his kind of um, question that he was setting up in his his project, let's say in the capital P sense of, of the word, his kind of investigation um, wa was really about the kind of effect of, uh, of creating something that seems to be sometimes floating or, or, or to not be very, you know, very structural, but at the same time be quite evocative of structure because that is the thing that plays with our mind, right? That plays with our expectation of how something stands up. But then at the same time, he, you know, he, he makes it kind of float uh, through that effect. And so I think, I think it's, it's very much about creating a certain um, image and a certain effect of, of how we understand um, uh, that work. I think that's something very difficult to do. Mm -hmm. I was helping architectural students uh, during my time at EPFL with their master projects and many of them came to me with this question or with this intent to make a project look like it's floating in the air. So it's something very common in architecture mm -hmm. but it's not something that is very easily achievable. And maybe I have the impression that is when it is achievable, it is through little details that you integrate in your project. And maybe it's not was not even your first focus at the first time. I there are some projects done by our Artigas, uh, which are really like they look really like they're floating in the air. And then he uses, he has these concrete structures and he uses these steel bearings that we usually use in, in bridges. Mm. Actually, a lot of uh, South American architects and engineers 
use this way of building. So when we went to uh, Salvador de Bahia, there were many buildings which actually looked like a bridge and had typical bridge sections. It's just that on top of that, there was no road. There mm -hmm. was a bridge. There mm -hmm. was a huge building. But this could be one of the ways how, throughout a small detail, you're capable of making your structure look like as it it would, as it it was floating. I have another question for you. So maybe we will slowly come to an end. And it is about the border between structure and design, since we are on this topic. I think I am citing Le Corbusier, but I'm not, I'm not sure that it was him who said that the new architecture should be like a car, designed for the human and for your needs, where everything is at hand's reach. And nowadays, uh, cars are not so in vogue anymore, maybe also from a sustainability point of view. And I'm a huge fan of bicycles. I'm a huge fan of road bicycles. And when I look at road bicycles, there is no, um, there is nothing around it. So every single piece of a road bicycle is both structural and ergonomical at the same time. It, it's supposed to make you feel the most comfortable for when you're going for a 200 kilometer ride or when you're spending the whole day on your bicycle but it's performing at the same time and there is nothing around it that makes it seem something else. Mm -hmm. it's, with cars, it's completely different. We have a design around it that is an eye catcher, mm -hmm. but we don't really see what's inside. Mm -hmm. And I would say the future for architecture for me should be like bicycles. There, nothing should be hidden and it should be the true expression uh, of the performance of the building, which is made for you and for your ergonomics. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, I, I think it's, um, it's, it's fascinating that you bring that up. Um, again, coming, going back now, almost full circle, um, you were in the very beginning saying about how, uh, I think you were saying it was Mario Botta that said his, his dream was to design a chair. And I think a chair is a similar type of thing, right? Like where everything is exposed to a certain degree. It's about the ergonomics, but it's also about the structure and it's also about, you know, so you cannot divorce one from the other. Um, and, and I would tend to agree with that. I think a lot of what we've been doing in our office, what I've been trying to do with my students as well, uh, teaching at Harvard, but also at PFL, EPFL, um, is, um, is really to take it down to the to the most basic, most elemental elements that we have, to not think about those things, which previously has been the case, you know, to think about structures or to think about the, the kind of building systems as something which is to be solved after, but really as the thing which defines architecture, as how we can kind of integrate that spatially, experientially, ergonomically, you know, um, for the longevity of a building. And one of the analogies that I personally use a lot, uh, I've been, you know, uh, doing that also in, in, in the, some lectures that I've been giving, um, is the idea of a table. Um, maybe more so than a chair, because a chair is very personal. Uh, I like the, the idea of a table because a table is about always different ways of uh, engaging with different people. Um, you know, so if you think about, let's say, a dinner table, um, there's, of course, ergonomics that's related to it, but it's also very, very simple. It's nothing more than just a tabletop with, you know, structure that holds it up. Um, the structure, you know, of course, um, does not have to be elaborate. And in, in a lot of cases, in fact, the, the most beautiful ones are very, very simple. Um, but at the same time, it's all about the people that are sitting around it. And it's all about giving that kind of generosity and possibility of doing different things on that table. So, you know, it could be a dining table one, one hour and then the next hour it could be a meeting table and then something else, you know. I think that that, that aspect of it um, for me is what's, what's important maybe about this, um, this collaboration between engineers and architects and where we can take it next. Okay, thank you very much. I think this is a great point to finish. And I hope to see you again. 
Thank you. Great. Thank you very much. Thank you for listening to the FIB podcast. For more information, please visit www.fib-international.org. See you next time.